Thanks, here. Talk a fair bit about, uh, in addition to the forecasting itself, the messaging that NHC from sort of the NAP, in terms of uh, you know, sort of driving the national message to get everybody ready for tropical cyclone events. So, um, first, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm originally from uh, Southwest Virginia, from the Roanoke area. Um, I attended uh, North Carolina State for my undergraduate and graduate uh, work. Started there in 1996. Uh, finished grad school in 2005. I did my PhD work on the uh, January 2000 surprise uh, snowstorm that affected the southeast uh, states from the Carolinas up through the Washington, D.C. area. It's sort of a rather infamous forecast failure at the time uh, associated with an extratropical cyclone. So I dug into that a fair bit for my PhD work. After that, I took a, a detour into looking into or working in the tropical community. I came to NHC as a, a UCAR postdoc working on research, doing research operations work for satellite ocean vector winds at the time, focused mainly on QuickScat and the early part of the ASCAT mission. Um, from there, I went on to serve as the science officer at uh, what's now the Weather Prediction Center in College Park. It was then the HPC in Camp Springs, Maryland for about 18 months in 2007 to 2008. Came back, back to NHC uh, late in 2008 as a senior hurricane specialist and was in that role for about uh, nine and a half years. I became the branch chief of the Hurricane Specialist Unit in 2018. So uh, over that 10 year period, I wrote about 600 uh, forecast packages on tropical cyclones uh, during that time. And I, I still do a little bit of forecasting now, but my main role at this point is overseeing the Hurricane Forecast Unit here at NHC, and supervising that group of 10 forecasters, uh, you know, doing involved in things like policy and training and uh, do a fair bit of uh, IDSS in terms of briefings for FEMA and states all the way down to the local level during hurricane events and sort of coordinating the national level messaging that we put out uh, during those storms. And since my time as a branch chief, we've obviously had a lot of very impactful uh, tropical cyclones affect the United States. I was acting branch chief during most of the 2017 hurricane season that included Harvey and Irma and Maria. And obviously we had uh, Florence and Michael in 2018, Dorian in 2019. So we've had a, a pretty significant string of uh, activity here in the last couple of years. So what I want to cover uh, this evening is uh, give a quick overview of NHC, talk a little bit about hurricane hazards, and then go into uh, the, the bulk of the talk's going to be on our analysis and forecast process. And then I'll wrap up with uh, some thoughts about uh, tropical cyclone hazard messaging. So um, the, our mission and vision here at NHC is we're one of the, the nine INSEP centers, and we're focused on saving lives and mitigating property loss and improving economic efficiency by issuing the best watches, warnings, forecasts, and analyses of hazardous tropical weather, including tropical cyclones. And uh, we also have a big training part of our mission by increasing the understanding of these hazards for the emergency management and governmental community so that folks can take preparedness and evacuation actions ahead of tropical cyclone threats. So um, a little bit about the hurricane forecast service history in the United States. It goes back quite a long time, about 150 years almost now, uh, predating the creation of the Weather Bureau all the way back to the U.S. Army Signal Corps days, and the first cautionary signal, which would sort of be the equivalent of today's hurricane warning, was issued in 1873. Uh, hurricanes were a big threat to uh, naval and maritime interests, especially in the late parts of the 19th century. Uh, the lack of uh, even analysis and, and real-time weather information then, especially for ships at sea, uh, resulted in numerous uh, maritime disasters in that, that period of history and uh, it was a, a greater threat to uh, naval interest than maybe the, the uh, enemy's navy was during the Spanish-American War. Uh, in 1935, the Hurricane Forecasting Service in the United States was actually decentralized out of Washington uh, into several offices that you actually see here on this graphic uh, following some forecast failures in the early part of the 20th century. You can see that the, uh, there were, it was split up between offices that range from San Juan to Miami to New Orleans to Washington and Boston. Um, and actually in 1935, that's when this sort of six hourly forecast and warning cycle that we still work with today began. And that was the beginning of a 24 hour forecast service. So basically making a one day forecast of where we thought the hurricane might be started uh, in 1935. Going on to 1965, about 30 years later, the National Hurricane Center name was adopted for part of the Miami uh, Weather Bureau office. 
And over the next 22 years, all of the responsibility for tropical cyclone forecasting in the Atlantic Basin and, and the Eastern North Pacific Basin was consolidated into NHC by 1987. Uh, it took us a long time to get from one day to two day forecast. We started making two day forecast in 1961, went very quickly to three day forecast three years later, and then it took us about 40 years to get out to five day forecasts. And in 2003, we also officially added the area in the eastern part of the basin, uh, east of 35 west in the Atlantic to our area of responsibility. And uh, one of the more recent advances we made in 2017 was the introduction of storm surge watches and warnings for the United States Atlantic and Gulf Coast that expanded to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands to really separate out the focus on that particular hazard. And what you're looking at here on the right side of the screen is the, is the first uh, storm surge watch and warning that was issued for the United States for Hurricane Harvey in 2017. So at NHC, we really are providing the big picture. We're following a tropical cyclone through its entire life cycle, all the way from before Genesis occurs, through development, peak intensity, and all the way through decay, and even into the post-tropical phase. And we're really providing the big picture. You know, where is the storm going in terms of the track forecast? How strong is it? How big is it? And we're focused again on the large scale impacts. Uh, but local impacts in the United States for you know, what's going to happen down in the community scale are going to be provided by local WFOs. And that uh, same role is really provided by local meteorological services internationally. So again, we provide the same level of service both to the U.S. and to, uh, to international areas within our area of responsibility. So, you know, our product suite is, uh, you know, sort of, again, storm relative. So before we have a system, or more than five days out, you know, the uncertainty about hazard information and what's going to happen at a, very, at a community level is quite large given the uncertainty and where the storm might go, its eventual intensity and size. So this sort of a pyramid shape sort of can, it depicts the amount of information that's available in terms of how far away the storm might be from your particular area. You know, beyond five days, you might only have a tropical weather outlook, which is going to talk about the potential for tropical cyclone formation. Or you might have a forecast that, again, doesn't get out uh, as far into the future as it needs to, to affect it for when the storm might be affecting your area. Once we get into that three to five day range, we have a five day forecast of the position, the intensity, and the size of the storm. We have wind speed probabilities that provide the likelihood of uh, seeing sustained tropical storm and hurricane force winds at a given location. We have the tropical cyclone discussion. It's gonna talk about the forecast uncertainty uh, and uh, you know, the forecaster reasoning. Then as we get into the two to three day time frame, where that's the time in which you're gonna see tropical storm, hurricane, and storm surge watches issued. And the one to two day time frame is when you're going to have to be in the warning phase. There'll be more products from the WFOs in terms of local statements. The storm surge operational real time storm surge products will be available. And that's, uh, that's when we can provide obviously the most information about what might actually be occurring at a given location. A little bit of history about our track and intensity forecast errors. This is a chart showing our uh, average track forecast error in nautical miles on the y-axis uh, and the for, you know, for the different forecast hours on the x-axis, uh, averaged together by decade. So you can see, starting in the 1960s, uh, just say, for example, the three days out in 1960s, our average track forecast error in three days was over 400 nautical miles. That uh, decreased rather slowly through the 70s and 80s. Still in the 1980s, we were about 350 nautical miles. Um, really significant improvements in numerical weather prediction, and uh, especially in the global models, has really led to this big decrease in track forecast errors over the last uh, 30 years or so. You can see now over the last decade, our average three-day track forecast error was 100 nautical miles. So it's about 20, uh, about 20, a quarter of what it was uh, you know, 50 years ago. So it's a really tremendous improvement in uh, our ability to predict storm track. And again, that's largely driven by improvements in the global models, data assimilation, better physics, uh, better, uh, obviously, higher resolution and more computing power that's driven in that. Now, in contrast, if you look at the trend in the average intensity forecast errors, uh, you know, for the last, uh, from the 1970s all the way through the first decade of this century, there was very, very little change in our intensity forecast errors. For example, the two days, the average error was in that 15 to 16, 17 knot range for 40 or 50, about 40 year time period. But in this decade, we've actually seen those errors start to decrease. You can see in the black line, the average errors have begun to come down, especially 
at uh, 36 hours and beyond. A lot of that's due to uh, significant improvements in dynamical hurricane modeling, with uh, especially driven by things like the H wharf, which uh, were uh, really driven by the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project that Congress passed in the wake of the 2004 and 2005 hurricane seasons, that devoted a lot of, excuse me, a lot of computational resources to uh, hurricane uh, modeling in particular. And in, in reality, before that time, statistical dynamical models were still the best intensity guidance we had. And that's really changed in the last 10 years, where the dynamical models now are making much more use of uh, in situ observations from aircraft reconnaissance, tail Doppler radar, other observing systems are actually you know, performing real time data assimilation and actually you know, analyzing the tropical cyclone vortex and uh, give, giving us a much better depiction of what that system could do over the next five days relative to what we were dealing with before. So, um, now I'll talk a little bit about tropical cyclone hazards. So, you know, most of the time when you give a talk, if you ask people to close their eyes and tell you what they think about when they think about a hurricane, almost everybody is going to answer the wind. And uh, that's not surprising. The wind gets a lot of attention, but the wind doesn't really kill very many people. The hazards that kill the most people are the water hazards, storm surge, and increasingly in the last few years in this country has been flooding uh, and uh, its effects due to rainfall. But we also have uh, impacts from the wind itself, from the hurricane, uh, from tornadoes, typically in outer rain bands, and then also waves and rip currents that can emanate from a storm that might be thousands of miles away and can still be deadly as we saw in Lorenzo in 2019. So, uh, as I mentioned, water is what really kills. Um, if you look at the U.S. tropical cyclone fatalities, these are direct deaths. So these are uh, deaths due to the direct forces of the storm. Water, in some way, shape, or form, accounts for about 90 of 90 percent of the fatalities. Uh, storm surge itself kills about 50 percent of the people. If you go back and look at the long-term uh, numbers over this 50-year period, flooding due to rainfall uh, kills about 27 percent. Another 12% uh, of the fatalities are, occur offshore or in rough surf. And then the remaining 11 to 12% occur from either uh, direct forces of the wind itself from the storm, tornadoes, or either other or unknown fatalities. Now, as I mentioned, in recent years, 83% uh, of the fatalities have been water-related if you look at the 2016 to 2018 timeframe, and most of those were due to inland flooding. Only 4% were storm surge related in the past few years, despite having multiple major hurricane landfalls in the United States. We've had a relatively small number of storm surge fatalities, about five. Uh, that's not to say that storm surge still can't kill very large numbers of people, as we likely saw during Dorian last year, or as we saw during Katrina in 2005. But we'd like to think that there's the increased emphasis on storm surge and the hazard associated with the storm surge warning has really help to, uh, to push that uh, awareness along. But in reality, the last few years, more than half of the US tropical cyclone water-related fatalities were occurring in vehicles. Basically, people driving out into flooded areas around barricades. So we have a real vehicle-related problem in this country in terms of uh, tropical cyclone fatalities. The ones that are due to water are increasingly due to uh, are associated with people in motor vehicles. Now we get away from the direct fatalities and we look at what we call indirect deaths. Now these are fatalities that are not directly attributable to the forces of the storm. It means that somebody didn't drown or somebody wasn't hit by a falling tree. But these are people who die uh, because of the indirect effects of the storm. So if the storm didn't happen, these fatalities probably would not have occurred. And if you go back and look over that period from 1963 to 2012, you'll see a large number of these are related to cardiovascular incidents, people having heart attacks, there's a fair number or percentage of them that are related to evacuations itself or associated with motor vehicle accidents. Uh, you have falls, you have uh, fatalities related to carbon monoxide poisoning, fires, accidents uh, that people, uh, uh, that happen to people when they're taking their shutters up, putting their shutters up or taking their shutters down. So uh, these are almost as large as the direct fatalities now. So we're having more people to survive the storm itself but we're having people perish after the storm. And historically, there hasn't been much attention paid to these fatalities in the literature. Uh, in some ways, probably because not many people survived the storm a long time ago, uh, you had more direct fatalities. You didn't have people around in these vulnerable positions where there was no power, no medical services after an event. 
to, uh, to suffer these indirect fatalities. But what we've noticed too now in the last few years is that the, uh, the victims of these indirect fatalities are, are definitely skew older. About eight times as many victims are age 60 or above as, as uh, compared to uh, uh, victims that are 21 years old or younger. So these indirect fatalities are an increasing problem and they're increasingly affecting the uh, elderly half of the uh, population. So these are things that we're, we're trying to focus on here at our outreach. So any questions before we um, get started into the overview of the forecast process? <coughs> Okay, I'll go ahead, and uh, what I'm going to go through here in the next uh, part of the presentation is just an overview of the forecast process itself. So we work on this six hourly forecast cycle, as I mentioned before. The time in which the forecast is occurring is about three hours long. So the first part of the forecast cycle starts at the synoptic time. The first 45 minutes are basically the analysis that the forecaster conducts on the tropical cyclone, uh, you know, looking at fixed data or analysis data from satellite or aircraft or whatever data sources are available, analyzing the initial location, the initial motion, the intensity and size of the cyclone, and basically uh, sending off and retrieving the model guidance that we're going to use to make the track, the intensity, and the wind radii forecast. And then that next hour to an hour and 15 minutes is the actual making of the track intensity and wind radii forecast and we'll go through that process. Uh, the next 15 minutes or so is going to be the coordination process where we're going to uh, have a hotline call with the WFOs, other INSEP centers, coordinate U.S. And, and international watches and warnings and hazard information. Then the last 45 minutes or so are basically getting the products out uh, before the advisory deadline that's three hours after synoptic time. Again, here's just another look at that timeline. It's pretty compressed. Uh, you know, in, in a situation where we have watches and warnings going on, leading up to that synoptic time, we'll be issuing the tropical weather outlook, talking about the potential for systems that could develop into tropical cyclones in the next five days. We'll be issuing an intermediate public advisory, uh, updating the position, the intensity, and information associated with the storm if we have land-based watches and warnings in effect. And then again, getting ready to do that analysis uh, analysis <clears throat> process, going through the forecast, the advisory deadline, doing briefings, coordination calls, and then getting ready to do the whole process again uh, six hours later. So at synoptic time, the, the, the forecast cycle basically begins with the hurricane specialist analyzing all the available observations. Sometimes there's a lot of observations. Sometimes we're lucky enough to have aircraft reconnaissance. We can have ground-based radar. Uh, Geostationary satellite imagery is always available. Uh, in some places, we're lucky enough to have ships and buoys and land observations, uh, microwave imagery, scatterometry. Uh, other times, you're left with nothing but geostationary satellite imagery, um, especially when you're uh, far away from land areas. Uh, you're not going to have much ship and buoy observations. You're not going to have any land data. You're beyond the range of aircraft reconnaissance, uh, certainly beyond the uh, range of land-based radar, and you're really uh, relying solely on satellite uh, 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 observations, which, uh, you know, our satellite basically is the determination of our main determiner of our intensity as estimates about two-thirds of the time in the Atlantic Basin and probably 90% of the time in the East Pacific. So uh, having data when storms get closer to land is obviously a nice luxury uh, and provides us obviously a lot more direct information about the uh, intensity and structure of the system. So. What the forecaster is going to inherit is a, a working best track. And so I'm going to take you through an example of an actual storm. The example's a little old, but it still serves the purpose. So this is a paper track map that we mocked up for this particular example. So what you're looking at here in this uh, black line or the pencil line is basically the working track of the center of the storm uh, every six hours going back about a day or two. Um, so the last position at 12Z would have been uh, here just off the western tip of Jamaica. You can see that over the ensuing uh, couple of days, the storm moved rather slowly from south of Hispaniola and along the southwestern coast of Jamaica. Uh, each of the colored lines you're looking at here are what we call center fixes. So they're estimates of the center location of the tropical cyclone that are coming either from satellite, uh, from microwave satellite imagery, from, uh, and from aircraft. So for example, the color key here is this would be a, a TAF-B or a tropical analysis and forecast branch, the Dvorak 
uh, center estimate from the uh, of, uh, from geostationary imagery. The pencil line would be from the satellite analysis branch. Microwave imagery uh, center fixes are in green. The uh, red triangles are center fixes from the Air Force aircraft, and blue triangles are center fixes from the NOAA aircraft. So you can see we're in a situation here where we have a relative wealth of data. We obviously have aircraft in the storm, so we're going to have a pretty good idea of where it is. And uh, here's what that working best track looks like in our ATCF system, which is the computer system that's our database and actual forecast and product preparation tool for tropical cyclones. So you can see the track of the storm indicated here by the symbols every six hours connected by the dashed lines. And then the various diamonds and triangles are these center fixes over the last uh, uh, you know, couple of days. So we have a reconnaissance aircraft that's going to be flying into the system. So we're working on the 18Z uh, forecast cycle here that's going to culminate in the release of the advisory at about 21Z. So we have an Air Force aircraft flying into the storm that's going to be uh, providing fixed data at 18Z and at 0Z. Uh, these are the locations we're sending them to. They took off at 15Z, so they're on their way into the storm now. They're going to be flying to a position around 18.7 north, 79.9 west. We also have a Gulfstream 4 jet, a uh, synoptic surveillance mission planned for 0Z tonight that will be departing at 1730Z to fly around the storm. So here's what we're looking at in terms of available data. So we have our geostationary satellite uh, imagery. This is a visible satellite loop covering a six hour period from uh, around 12Z this morning up till now when we're right at about that 18Z time frame. So you can see a, a well-defined system, uh, not too much of a, a mystery as to where the center of this probably is, well-defined rotation, at least in the mid-level clouds that we're seeing here in the, in the uh, visible imagery. Uh, you can see a system moving generally off to the west-northwest, uh, to the west of Jamaica, toward the Cayman Islands. Uh, here's what infrared satellite loop with a Dvorak uh, color curve. So this is a color curve that allows the, an analyst to look at the uh, uh, structure and uh, development of thunderstorm activity, how much it wraps around the center. If there were an eye, it would be doing a, a cloud temperature, a cloud type temperature difference between the convection surrounding the eye and the warm temperatures inside the eye itself and coming up with an intensity estimate based off the pattern in the infrared imagery. So this is again infrared over that same period. Have a nice central dense overcast. Um, some, maybe some hints of a warm spot trying to develop within the CDO in the last hour or two, but a very well all the circular, pretty symmetric cloud pattern that we have associated with this uh, tropical cyclone right now. Here's a water vapor loop sort of backing out for a larger view. You can see that the, the system's situated in a relatively favorable environment. It has a nice upper level outflow, particularly along the, the northern semicircle and to the southeast. It might be a little restricted to the southwest. Uh, no obvious you know, real negative factors in terms of the large scale environment. There's an upper level low here to the northeast of our tropical cyclone, another upper low here over the southeastern United States, but overall sort of an upper level ridging environment should be favorable for uh, continued development uh, as we've seen in the imagery for the last 12 hours or so. So uh, we got a microwave image that we're going to take a look at now as uh, these come in with some degree of latency, so we might be looking at an image from three or four hours ago that's going to give us a nice view of the uh, emissions from the uh, cloud water and uh, ice particles in the cloud canopy that give almost like a radar-like view of the tropical cyclone rain band structure. So it allows you to look underneath that uh, uh, cold cloud top canopy. You're seeing an infrared imagery. And for example, here in the 91 gigahertz color composite, you see a nice mid-level eye that's uh, very apparent in the imagery here off the west coast of Jamaica. This again would have been at 1318Z, so we would be analyzing this, fit, uh, this image and providing a center fix. You can see in the 37 gigahertz composite that looks at the lower level rain band structure. Unfortunately, this is at a lower spatial resolution, so you don't really see as much detail here in the rain band structure in the low levels as you do in the mid levels. But there's again some hint of a circulation center in the low levels here uh, to the west of Jamaica that lines up pretty closely with where that mid level eye is. So based on that, we would make a center fix uh, in the ATCF. Based on that, we would put the center at 18.5 and 78.5 at about 13.18Z. And that's going to show up on our uh, plot here. This is where we think the center of that storm was based on that microwave image about an hour and 20 minutes after the previous synoptic time, which would have been 12Z, which was when the storm was centered here just off the western tip of Jamaica. 
We have another image from a different imager. This was the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission, which uh, no longer is with us, but was a very high quality microwave imager. This would have been a fix from around 1525Z. Again, providing a nice look at, again, a banding eye here in the uh, mid-levels in the 85 gigahertz color composite. And this uh, imager has a much higher resolution at the 37 gigahertz channel, and you can see a low-level eye forming in the, uh, in the uh, rain band feed, uh, structure here from the emission from the uh, raindrops in the low, uh, low levels in the, uh, in the rain bands. So you can see that that lines up very nicely in the vertical with the, uh, the mid-level eye, and again, uh, supports you know, a rather, rather well-defined system and obviously gives you a, a nice idea of where the center of the system is. At this time, at 1525Z, we'll go ahead and enter that fix in, and that would come up with about 18.6 and 78.9. So you, again, you can see this sort of general west-northwestward motion over the, uh, this again now, three hours and 25 minutes past the previous synoptic time. So we have a general idea of where the storm's been prior to our 18Z initial time. And now we're going to wait for the aircraft and satellite fixes to come in. And during this time, the forecaster is really going to start looking at the new uh, dynamical model guidance that's going to be coming in for the 12C model cycle. So we're going to look at the global or regional hurricane models uh, for the track forecast, get an idea of what their trends are looking like, what are the important steering features going to be, how is the steering flow and the pattern going to evolve over the next five days. So what we're looking at here is the four panel sort of a quick look at the, through the deep layer of the troposphere. What you're looking at here in color shading is 850 millibar relative vorticity. The brown contours are 500 millibar heights, and the uh, wind barbs are 200 millibar winds and knots from the uh, GFS in the upper left, the European in the upper right, the GFDL hurricane model in the lower right, and the UK MET model, global model, in the lower left. And this is the analysis that we're looking at here at 12Z. So again, you can see that upper level low to the northeast of the storm, an upper level trough situated over the Gulf of Mexico, but very favorable upper level, light upper level winds with some anticyclonic outflow noted here at the 200 millibar level centered over the storm. Now, as we step on ahead through the next, uh, now this would have been the 12, this first frame would have been the 12Z analysis from this morning's run, and six hours later would be the initial time of our forecast. So we're going to step out ahead. We'll go out in about 30 hours to a 24-hour uh, forecast in our time period. You can see that the storm continues to move generally west northwestward, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the western tip of Cuba, as it's moving around the periphery of this large mid-level ridge centered over the western Atlantic. You can see a kind of a weakness in the ridge over the Gulf of Mexico in association with that upper-level trough, and that's going to allow the storm to generally turn uh, west northwestward to northwestward, and now we're at a 72 hour time frame. And the models are showing the system coming or approaching the central Gulf Coast and move, moving inland, uh, either over portions of the lower Mississippi Valley or southeastern Texas, southwestern Louisiana, with some variations in the forward speed. Uh, obviously, with the configuration of the upper level pattern over the CONUS with the developing ridge here with the mid Atlantic states and a broad, or a broad trough moving into the central and western United States. The interaction of that trough with the tropical cyclone and how strong that system is is going to obviously play a role in the track forecast over the next five days. And so we'll actually look at the model tracker information uh, as we uh, go forward in time. But as you look at this overall pattern, there's not a lot of major differences in the models in terms of the overall uh, synoptic pattern is going to have a storm moving west northwestward and northwestward toward the northern Gulf Coast <clears throat> over the next uh, three to five days with some uh, significant variations in forward speed, especially later on in the forecast period. So those are things we'll be paying attention to when we make our track forecast. Now here are plots from the uh, regional hurricane models, the GFDL hurricane model on the left, the H wharf model on the right. Again, quite similar tracks. Uh, again, west northwestward across portions of western Cuba and into the northern Gulf of Mexico, although you can see some pretty significant differences late in the forecast period with the GFDL model taking the system definitively inland across Louisiana and Arkansas, whereas the H wharf sort of uh, stalls the system off the uh, northern Gulf Coast just south of Louisiana. But both, system, uh, both models show the system deepening rather significantly, uh, producing uh, winds in the major category three to category four range, central pressures, uh, then the GFDL model down in the 940s, the H-Wharf down to the 9, 
uh, 10 to 920 range. So we, uh, from this, you would expect to see a, a significantly intensifying cyclone moving into the Gulf of Mexico in the next few days. So now at this point, we'll be receiving what we call our fixed data. Again, Dvorak uh, satellite estimates of the location and the intensity of the storm from two different agencies that are going to uh, allow us to begin determining the center location at 18Z, the past motion of the storm over the last 6 to 12 hours, and then we'll determine the intensity uh, or wind speed of the storm, the central pressure, and then the various wind radii, the uh, maximum extent of the 34, 50, and 64 knot winds in each quadrant uh, that will you know, basically use any data we can get it's from scatterometers to surface observations to aircraft. Now, we also have reconnaissance data in this uh, case. As we have noted earlier, we have the storm flying in for an 18Z fix. They reach the center of the storm around 1721Z. They fix the center of the storm at about 18 degrees, 44 minutes north, 79 degrees, and 8 minutes west, so that's 18, uh, 18 degrees and about a little over 7 tenths of a degree north and 79.1 west. The maximum surface wind they found from the aircraft at, from the step frequency microwave radiometer was 57 knots. The flight level wind was 48 knots. The minimum pressure they found was 984 millibars, excuse me. But on their way out from the center, they actually found a, a higher flight level wind of 62 knots. And they, uh, uh, in the southeastern quadrant at 1734 today. So that gives us an idea of what the aircraft has found. And now we'll take a look at the uh, flight, uh, the satellite intensity estimates. So with that uh, maximum flight level wind of 62 knots, if you use our sort of standard reduction to, uh, that accounts for the decay of the boundary layer of the wind as you go down and also accounts for some undersampling in the wind field, that would equate to about a 56 knot wind at the surface based on uh, that observation. So we're going to go ahead and put that aircraft fixed data in there into the ATCF. Again, very high confidence in the uh, location of the storm uh, at 1721Z based on that aircraft fix. It's going to be fixed by the, uh, the uh, weather reconnaissance officer on the plane based on the wind data. So uh, again, a position here of uh, 18.7 and 79.1. Now we're going to get our uh, Dvorak estimates. This is the position estimate from the uh, visible satellite imagery, and the infrared imagery from uh, the, our tropical analysis and forecast branch here at the National Hurricane Center who provide the independent Dvorak estimates that we use here. So they came up with a position of 18.8 north, 79.2 west. Their intensity estimate was T4.0, which would be 65 knots, so right at the hurricane threshold. The satellite analysis branch up in uh, the Washington, D.C. area provides a, another Dvorak fix. They came up with a position of 18.7, 79.2, so you can see the two positions were at about a tenth of a degree of each other. So very good agreement there. And the uh, initial intensity from SAB was uh, also T4.0, so again, suggesting that the system is a hurricane. So now we'll put our uh, Dvorak estimates in with the aircraft, and you can see they're all clustered nicely together, which is uh, something we like to see. They all suggest a continued uh, west-northwestward motion from the previous best track position at 12Z through the, uh, along those microwave fixes and now to the Dvorak and the aircraft fixes that we have uh, as we approach 18Z. So we're going to uh, basically come up with our analysis as the hurricane specialist is going to come up with their analysis of where they think the system center is now. Again, remember noting that the storm is moving along. There would be some difference probably by 18Z from what the aircraft found about 40 minutes earlier. So you can see we went with a best track position at 18Z of 18.8 north, 79.2 west. We initialized the initial intensity of the system as uh, 60 knots. Uh, sort of a blend of the Dvorak estimates, which are a little higher, and the aircraft data, which supported about 55 knots, and a central pressure of 984 millibars. And we went ahead and used the aircraft data to come up with the initial wind radii uh, in the northeast quadrant, 34 knots, 130 nautical miles, the largest extent of the 50 knot winds in the northeast quadrant, 60 nautical miles. And then this is the type of plot data we would actually use uh, to start looking at the wind radii. Again, we're getting, uh, these are flight level winds and barbs and knots from the aircraft and surface winds and the numbers here from the SFMR. And these are the wind radii we inherited from the 15Z advisory. So we would look at the new data as it comes in and make adjustments to those uh, wind radii as we go along through the forecast process. 
Next, we would determine the value and radius of the outermost closed isobar from a surface analysis. So you, we basically conduct an analysis of the pressure field. This is a situation where we actually have quite a bit of data, uh, all the way from ship and buoy observations to land stations. We certainly know where the center of the storm is. You're basically looking at the outermost isobar, which you can close off in the wind field around the storm. So in this situation, it looks to be about 1,008 millibars. If you get out to 1,010, the uh, isobar is no longer closed. So the wind field, this is sort of a bulk measure of the size of the storm, it's about 1,008 millibars. And so you would basically take a, a, an average distance of that 1,008 millibar isobar from the center of the storm, and that would be the radius of the outermost closed isobar. So now we have our best track data through 18Z, and we're ready to basically initialize and set up the model guidance for the next, uh, next forecast cycle. So we're going to send, uh, and one step in that is computing the motion of the storm. What's a representative motion of the storm over the last 12 hours or so? So you can do this the old-fashioned way on paper. You can uh, measure out the distance between where we thought the, our best track position was at 6Z and 18Z. You get about 102 nautical miles of distance over a 12-hour period that yields an initial motion of about eight or nine knots during that time. And the heading at that point is about 300 degrees. So you can see it sped up from our previous advisory motion was 295 at seven. Now we're 300 at about eight or nine. So we're gonna set up all this information and send it up to the Weather Service's WCOS supercomputer that's gonna go and help set up the GFS and uh, the HWARF and the HMON models for the next uh, dynamical model cycle. So all that information gets sent up and we uh, send up the, uh, the hurricane models as well. So at this point, we probably wait about three or four minutes for all that information to get up there. And then we're gonna pull in the dynamical model guidance from the 12Z cycle and interpolate that to our initial position of the storm here at 18Z. So we're gonna take the 12Z GFS, for example, put the six hour forecast of the 12Z GFS on top of our 18Z position of the storm and then lay that track out. And we're gonna do that with all the other dynamical model guidance from the 12Z cycle. And so that gives us a look at our track model guidance for this particular forecast. So all that model guidance is gonna begin with the initial position and where we think the storm is now and we're gonna go ahead and make the track forecast from that information. And here's what the intensity guidance looks like. Again, we do a similar interpolation of the intensity models starting them all out at our 60 uh, knot in initial intensity and looking at the trend of that guidance from here on out through the five-day forecast period. So now we'll go on and make the track forecast. So again, here's what the model guidance actually looks like. So these are five-day tracks of the models, some of which we looked at when we looked at the model fields before. So here's the UK Met, here's the ECMWF, here's the GFDL, here's the GFS. OFCI in the light blue line is our previous official forecast that's now been updated for our initial position in motion. So that would sort of be the no change forecast. If we were going to just make no change, we would probably make the new forecast as close to OFCI as possible. But obviously we're going to look at the trends in the model guidance. We're going to see things like the Florida State Super Ensemble, the consensus aids which average together the best performing track model guidance. Uh, right now it's the best performing five or six models and that usually provides us our uh, sort of initial starting point for our forecast. Again, also trying to maintain continuity with our previous forecast so that we're not pulling the official forecast around drastically from cycle to cycle without seeing consistent trends in the model guidance. So what we're gonna do is look at model trends first. So how have the models been changing over the last few forecast cycles? So we go back to about uh, three cycles ago, 0Z zero zero on the 29th, what did the models look like? So uh, you can see for 0Z, zero zero, this would have been the guidance from last evening's forecast. Most of the guidance had a track uh, near over the western tip of Cuba, perhaps through the Yucatan Channel, and then up toward the north central Gulf of Mexico. Most of the guidance showing some sort of a westward turn uh, as the system reaches the northern Gulf Coast in about five days, obviously some significant spread there between the Navy model here still offshore of Texas and the GFDL, which is off to the right up here into Arkansas. So significant forward speed differences as well as a cross track variability. The 6E model guidance had a bit of a rightward shift in the models, uh, especially the GFS. You can see a pretty significant shift from a track into south, uh, south central Louisiana to a track over into Mississippi in just six hours. Overall, the spread of the guidance increased during this time period. 12Z, the models sort of shift back to the left again. 
And then here's what we have at 18Z, a bit more of a leftward shift in the model guidance. So we haven't exactly had a steady uh, shift uh, or steady tend trend in the model guidance over the last 18 hours or so. It's sort of been this windshield wipering back and forth uh, to the left and right. But again, an overall track toward the west-northwest. You can see a much tighter spread in the guidance in the short range here, showing a track very near or over the western tip of Cuba, and then approaching the north northern Gulf Coast in that four to five day time period. So here's the trend of the consensus. The TBCN consensus has, has uh, trended westward itself over the last uh, four model cycles, so that's something to note. And here's the official forecasts. Uh, they've actually shifted northeastward. The 12Z FOP forecast shifted a little to the north and east, away from where the official forecast had been at 0 and 6Z. Now again, this is only a shift of about a degree, which is certainly not unusual out of the day five time frame. We only typically make model sh uh, shifts of uh, 30 or 60 nautical mile increments out that far in time, given the uncertainty. So while that might look like a big shift, in reality, it's not really that big, especially compared to the average track forecast here at that time frame. So now we'll go ahead and step through the forecast process. We're going to again look at the model guidance we have for this particular cycle. We're going to go ahead and go in, and now we're going to make the 12-hour forecast. So what we're looking at here, uh, these circles are basically a measure of forecast uncertainty. I won't get into the details here, but they're, uh, look at how much spread there is amongst the models that go into the multi-model track consensus. So this solid orange line is smaller than the dotted orange line, which means in this case, there's higher than normal confidence in the uh, track forecast. So we don't see a lot of difference in the multi-model consensus, which is here, compared to the previous official forecast, maybe just a tad slower. But in this situation, the, the uh, previous official forecast is sort of right in the middle of all the best model guidance. There's really no reason to deviate from OFCI and tweak the forecast by one or two tenths of a degree. Really no need to do that at this point for 12 hours. Now we'll go on to 24 hours. Again, relatively tight packing of the model guidance. The official forecast uh, position has the system over the Isle of Youth. Again, no real reason to stray from OFCI at this point in time and just sort of continue along that previous official forecast at 24 hours. At 36 hours, again, uh, not much of a trend, maybe a little bit of a westward shift in the guidance here. You can see the GFS coming out pretty far to the west away from the previous official forecast. A couple of models over to the east, but sort of a westward turn, so we've nudged the official forecast just westward by a tenth compared to OFCI, still a little bit faster than the multi-model consensus, but that may be being affected by the fact that the UK Met at this point is very, very slow compared to all the other guidance. 48 hours, again, a little more of a westward nudge, come maybe two or three tenths to the west where we put the official forecast here, just to the south of the ECMWF, just to the north of the multi-model consensus, a little bit of a westward shift compared to the previous official forecast. Again, you can see significant along track differences and across track differences with the UK Met being on the uh, left side and slow, the GFDL on the right side of the guidance and fast. Now we move on to 72 hours. Again, the new, now the, the previous official forecast is pretty far out to the right compared to where the new multi-model consensus is because the GFS has continued to shift back to the left, the Europeans over here to the left, the UK Mets to the left, the only model really to the right of the old official forecast is the GFDL, and it's sort of a right outlier at this point. So uh, for the official forecast, at this time we shifted the forecast west about half a degree, or excuse me, about a whole degree, from around 89 degrees west over to 90 degrees west. Now you could potentially make a bigger shift, but given the sort of winch wobbly uh, trend in the guidance from left to right over the previous forecast cycles, I wouldn't want to make a big shift over to the left here and then have the guidance shift back to the right and result in this kind of windshield wiper effect in the official forecast. So I'm going to choose to make a, a relatively modest westward adjustment in the track and then wait and see what the next uh, set of model guidance looks like. Now we'll go on to the 96 hour forecast. And now we really start to see that spread increase. Uh, we have both, again, a cross -tap track spread from the UK Met on the left to the GFDL on the right, and significant speed forward speed differences between the European and the GFS. The GFDL is fast, the UK Met is slow. The multi-model consensus, again, is somewhere sort of here in the middle. Here's the previous official forecast, which again lies 
well to the right of the multimodal consensus and was shifted a little faster and to the left uh, for this particular forecast, again, nudging toward the multimodal consensus for this cycle to the north-northwest of the previous official forecast, but not buying off wholesale on that westward shift. Now at 120 hours, again, not surprisingly, your largest uncertainty is going to be out here at day five. You can see again, uh, fast models continuing the trend of being fast, the European, the GFDL, uh, the GFDN, the no gaps on the sort of in the middle, but a little slower. The UK met very slow and to the left. The H wharf very slow and remaining offshore as we saw in the fields earlier. The GFS is sort of in the middle, but in terms of the forward speed, but well to the right of the multi-model consensus and even to the right of the previous official forecast. So at this point, we're going to basically make a slow uh, adjustment to the forecast, just nudge it a little bit to the north. And in a situation like this, we're not going to show a tremendous increase in forward speed given the uncertainty of the long track uh, speed of the storm. We're going to try to minimize our forecast error out at day five and really try to wait and see what future model trends look like. So again, You'll see us to make very, very conservative adjustments most of the time, especially in situations where the model guidance is being inconsistent or the spread is increasing. So here's what our new official forecast track looks like. Um, it's actually a little to the left of the previous official forecast, but again, lies a substantial bit to the right of the multi-model consensus uh, by about a degree or two by days four and five. And here's what the uh, new official forecast looks like from 18Z here compared to the old 120 hour forecast from 12Z without interpolating. So this is the actual change in the official forecast. So you see not much change at all in the first 36 hours and a slight westward and somewhat faster adjustment at days three through five. Now, during all this time, you have new data coming in. So you're going to have a new fix from the aircraft that's just arrived in 1911Z. Now the aircraft's measured uh, significantly higher winds. We've got uh, surface winds of 78 knots, flight level winds of 71 knots, which would suggest a surface wind of about 64 or 65 knots. So the question now is, do we have a hurricane? Uh, based on the falling pressure, 980 millibars, and the wind data, we're going to basically, at this point, interrupt our forecast process and put out a tropical cyclone update uh, to basically let the world know that we now think that the system has gone on and become a hurricane with maximum winds of near 75 miles per hour. So this is sort of something that's going to be going on all during the forecast process as you're monitoring the data as it comes in, and these things do happen sort of right in the middle of the forecast cycle. So now we'll go on and look at the intensity forecast. Again, we looked at these GFDL and Hurricane H wharf model tracks and intensities earlier. So we're going to be looking at those dynamical model forecasts. We have the Florida State Super Ensemble, uh, which is, again is a, a corrected consensus model that weights different input models differently based on their previous performance. And we're looking at the intensity forecast, obviously showing an intensifying storm up to major hurricane intensity in two to three days. And then we have our statistical dynamical models like the ships and the LGEM, which look at the uh, <clears throat> forecast parameters uh, associated with the storm through multiple uh, linear regression, things like vertical wind shear, sea surface temperature, uh, uh, low level stability, moisture in the atmosphere, the tendency of the vortex and things like the GFS model, the upper level divergence, and sort of how uh, past tropical cyclones have behaved in terms of intensity in these situations in the past. So this is gonna look at all the uh, contribution from these various predictors like sea surface temperature, vertical shear, and show how they are going, uh, should affect the intensity of the storm over the next five days. So you get sort of the forecast at the top, the, the values of the predictors here on the sheet, and then also the contributors of those predictors to the intensity change. So you can see the SST potential by 72 hours is positively contributing 12 knots to the intensity change. Vertical shear is quite low uh, and through the forecast period up through 48 hours at least. Is a positive factor, starts to increase later on. Uh, but overall, we see a, the ships in Elgin both forecasting the system to strengthen significantly up into the 90 to 95 knot range in the next 48 to 72 hours. The probability of rapid intensification, again, a statistical uh, uh, RI model that we would look at, again, looks at these various predictors and gives us a probability of seeing various rapid intensification thresholds over the next 24 hours. You can see the chance of seeing four, 25 knots of strengthening 
in the first 24 hours is 46%. We have a 35% chance of 30 knots and 32% chance of 35 knots. And these are quite significant, especially the 32% chance of 35 knots is almost eight times the background uh, sample mean of a four and a half percent for a 35 knot increase in intensity in a 30 in a, uh, a 24 hour period. So that's something we'll have to be mindful of. So now we're going to go ahead and look at a graph of the intensity guidance. We can see the trend of the intensity guidance over the next five days. This is actually a place where the forecaster can go on and make the intensity forecast. Uh, clicking on this map, looking at the various models, their forecast, and obviously the, an intensity consensus, which tends to perform better than any of the individual models, much like for track. An intensity consensus tends to do better and be our best guidance consistently uh, most of the time. So we can go ahead and enter the intensity forecast, starting a, showing a forecast of 70 knots in 12 hours, which seems pretty reasonable given that we have a 65 knot hurricane already. Uh, forecasting 85 knots in 24 hours, 95 knots in 36 hours, 100 knots at 48 and 72 hours, and then weakening as we're forecasting the system to move inland by day five. Some increase in shear over the northern Gulf Coast uh, as it approaches the Gulf Coast should induce some weakening. You can see a significant decrease in most of the intensity guidance uh, as we get to day four, and then uh, uh, obviously a uh, significant weakening as the system moves inland by day five. So we're going to go ahead and make our new official forecast. That was the previous one. So we made some adjustments upward again, not surprisingly, given that we have a 65 knot storm now, 75 knots in 12 hours. That doesn't seem out of the question. And we're going to go ahead and bump that intensity forecast up to a peak of 110 knots at 48 hours. Again, recalling that our probability of seeing a 30 knot increase from the ship's model was about 30%. We're going to go ahead and forecast that 30 knot increase from 60 to 90 knots here in the first 24 hours. And again, up to 85 knots uh, at about day four, and then inland 55 knots at day five. Now finally, we'll go on to the wind radii forecast, which again is quite uncertain because we don't always, we don't ever really have a complete picture of what the two-dimensional wind field looks like at the initial time. And the sort of making a bulk forecast of the size of the storm, we have limited guidance uh, we do have a radii consensus that uses statistical and dynamical models, that, but we're just trying to capture the basic trends in the, in the size of the storm. Is it going to get bigger or smaller? Are there going to be asymmetries that are due to the motion of the storm, uh, potential land interaction that could affect the size of the wind field? So again, we're going to go ahead and make those forecasts. Again, we forecast the 64 knot radii out to 48 hours and 34 and 50 knot radii out to 72 hours. And we have a graphical way to do this. We can look at the forecast at each quadrant of the storm. This would be, say, for 34 knot winds at 12 hours. Each of these dots represents a model forecast of the extent of the 34 knot winds in the quadrants of the storm out uh, at that 12 hour forecast time from northeast all the way around the northwest. And the forecaster would go through that and make those adjustments as needed. And so we are forecasting a, a growing storm. Here's a summary of the wind radii forecast showing those. 34 knot radii going out to as big as 160 nautical miles in the northeast quadrant, 90 nautical mile, 50 knot radii at 48 hours, and again showing a developing hurricane force wind field as we're forecasting a strengthening storm. And those wind radii become very important as we start to lay out the watches and warnings and start to think about timing for decision making and evacuations. So at this point in the forecast cycle, we're going to start thinking about, well, are we going to have to make any changes or issue any watches or warnings? So what's going to come up? Well, we have to think about the timing and the possibility or expectation of hurricane and tropical storm conditions. So the uh, definition of a hurricane watch means that hurricane conditions are possible somewhere within the watch area. And this watch is going to be issued 48 hours in advance of the onset of tropical storm force winds because that's the time at which basically preparation uh, period for the storm is over. You're going to want to want your evacuations to be done by the onset of tropical storm force winds, other precautions to be made. So the watch is designed to give people 48 hours of notice that hurricane conditions are possible. Again, somewhere within the watch area, not everywhere. The hurricane warning is issued when we expect hurricane conditions somewhere in the warning area, and that's going to be issued ideally 36 hours in advance of the anticipated onset of tropical storm force winds. Timing of the tropical storm watch and warning are similar. Tropical storm watch means conditions are possible within the watch area in the next 48 hours. Tropical storm warning means conditions are expected in the warning area within the next 36 hours. 
So, when we lay out the coastal tropical storm and hurricane watch as warnings, the warning and watch areas are based on several factors. They're not just based on the, efficient, the deterministic track of the storm. We have to take into account the uncertainty in the track forecast, the uncertainty in the size of the storm, and the uncertainty in the intensity forecast. So at this point, our average 48, our 24-hour track forecast error is about 50 nautical miles, or about 50 miles. The average 48-hour error is about 100 miles. And in addition to accounting for that uncertainty in the track of the storm and where the wind field is going to go and how big it's going to be, we also have to take into account the orientation of the forecast track with respect to the coastline. If you have a storm that's basically moving perpendicular to the coast, you can just account for the uncertainty on the left and the right of the track forecast and lay out the watch warning area that way. However, if you have a system that's moving parallel to the coastline, like uh, going back to like last year, like Dorian moving parallel to the coast of Florida and the southeastern US, you have to issue warnings for much larger areas because any deviation, especially in that situation, the left of the track forecast would bring those conditions to the coastline over a very large area. Now we also have responsibility for coordinating watches and warnings internationally with all the various meteorological services, the countries in the Caribbean, including and also including Mexico and Bermuda and Canada and all the Caribbean islands. So we uh, take that into account. And again, we're providing the forecast information to those islands and they're making their own watch warning decisions based on their own timelines and their own uh, levels of uh, confidence in the forecast. So, Again, this is our, what our actual forecast looks like, our deterministic forecast of the track of the storm and the wind radii. So in this very short range, we're certainly going to want to make sure there's a hurricane warning in effect for places like the Cayman Islands, out to 24 hours, the Isle of Youth in western Cuba, and uh, perhaps 36 hours. We have to think about the possibility of at least tropical storm conditions in portions of the Florida Keys and perhaps the dry Tortugas. At 48 hours, all of the tropical storm force winds are still well offshore of the northern Gulf Coast, so we don't have to worry about the issuance of any watches or warnings for the northern Gulf Coast on this forecast cycle, but that could be coming within the next uh, 24 hours or so. Certainly by the time we would get to the 72-hour forecast time, we have tropical storm force winds reaching the Gulf Coast, so a day from now we would certainly have some sort of watch in place uh, for that area. But again, we have to take into account all those uncertainties. So at this point, we would start calling uh, places like Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, Cuba, talking to WFO Key West, and coordinating that either on the phone or with Key West on the hurricane hotline. And this is the time in the forecast process where we're going to have that hotline coordination call. It's done on a video, uh, video, uh, uh, a video-enabled hotline now where we can actually see and talk to everybody. We can show people graphics about the forecast. We'll talk about our forecast reasoning, what's changed in terms of the forecast, our uncertainty. For the United States, we typically do pre-coordination of the watches and warnings via either NWS chat or uh, on the landline telephone, but the hotline is the place where we finalize all those watch warning decisions. And we're going to be coordinating all the hazard information about storm surge, rainfall and flooding, tornado and rip current hazards with the WFOs with WPC and SPC and basically get the national level messaging that's going to come out in the NHC advisory products all set up and ready to go so that we're all on the same page when the products to come out uh, at the top of the next hour. And then and after that hotline call you have about 30 or 45 minutes to get everything together for the forecast uh, advisory, the graphics and everything out the door and uh, get that all done. So that all happens in about a three hour time period. So before I take any questions about the forecast process, we'll go ahead and look and see how the forecast for this case happened to verify. This was actually Hurricane Gustav all the way back in 2008, but it's a really nice case because of the looking at the model variability. And you can see that we actually made the correct decision not to jump all the way over to the model consensus and move the official forecast too far to the left because the eventual track, forecast, track of the storm is shown here in the white line. The storm actually moved close to that GFDL track on the right side of the model guidance and then shifted back over to the left, came inland across south central Louisiana, and actually stayed a little bit to the right of our official forecast. So it was a good thing we didn't shift over to the left side of the model guidance in that one forecast cycle because that would have made the forecast worse in that particular case. Uh, the actual track forecast errors were much lower than the long-term averages at those times. 
So you can see graphically here, the 12 hour forecast had an error of about 25 nautical miles. We were off by about 18 nautical miles at day, day one, about 40 nautical miles in day two, and bigger errors here, days three, four, and five, a lot of a long track error. At 72 hours, we were too slow uh, by about 130 nautical miles. At 96 hours, we were again too slow by about 150 nautical miles, and we were too slow at day five by 222 nautical miles. So the models that were showing the hurricane slowing down and turning to the left uh, ended up being incorrect. So it's important to remember that the trends are not always going to be right. You want to look for consistent trends that manifest themselves over multiple forecast cycles and make sense with what you're seeing in the model fields. But again, uh, tightly packed model guidance is no guarantee of low forecast error. And that's an important thing to remember when you're issuing watches and warnings and, and trying to convey the uncertainty of the forecast and get people not to pay so much attention to the actual deterministic forecast itself. In, in terms of the intensity forecast, Gustav rapidly intensified as advertised, but much more than we forecast. We forecast 30 knots of intensity change in 24 hours, which was a really big gutsy call back in 2008, and the storm strengthened by about 60 knots, and actually 70 knots if you go out 30 hours. So we had some really big forecast errors here in the short range, and then obviously our forecasts were too uh, slow later on in time, so the storm was actually farther inland and moved inland faster and weakened faster than we expected in our forecast. So we racked up some pretty large errors here in the late part of the forecast period too. A 65 knot error, for example, here at 96 hours, whereas the storm had already gone in and weakened to a tropical depression by that time. So deterministic intensity forecasting is a very, very difficult problem. Not only getting the trend right, but getting the timing of these rapid intensification events right, the weakening that occurs typically after RI, and then obviously timing landfall right is very, very important to getting the shape and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the shape and the magnitude of the intensity forecast correct. So um, any questions on the sort of forecast process itself? I know we're at about, have gone on for about an hour here, so uh, it's a good time to stop before I get into some of the messaging uh, aspects. I'm gonna try to make it easier, so I'm gonna give uh, Mike, you guys wanna come up and talk, uh, give your question, just have a mic here so you can hear it better, because it's probably not gonna be easy for him to hear from over here. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> So we have the ability, well, uh, I'll sort of address the landfall part first. So when we have a storm uh, with watches and warnings in effect for land areas, we're issuing intermediate advisories every three hours. That is basically just a public advisory. It's not a new forecast. It's an update of the storm's position, the intensity, uh, location, and sort of uh, observational information that we can provide. And then when we have... Uh, when the center is close enough and is well-defined enough to be tracked by our land-based radar, we'll issue hourly position estimates in between those public advisories. So we would have, say, a public advisory that goes out at 21Z, we would have an hourly position estimate at 22 and 23Z, an intermediate advisory at 0Z, and an hourly position estimate at 1Z and 2Z, followed by the next full advisory at 3Z. So there's a sort of hourly flow of information that's gonna update uh, at least the position, the motion, the intensity of the storm. And then if there's some sort of unanticipated change in the storms, uh, most of the time intensity, but occasionally track, we have the ability at any time to issue what we call a special advisory, which is a whole new forecast package. And that can come out at any time that we deem it necessary uh, within the forecast process. But generally that happens within that first three hours after the advisory goes out. Uh, once we're too far into the next forecast cycle, say by uh, an hour and a half in, we really can't go back and update the previous forecast. We just have to sort of wait for the next forecast package to come out. But we can again use those tropical cyclone update products to sort of convey what's going to be coming in terms of changes. But that sort of unanticipated change, if, if we have an intensity forecast that's off by 
10 knots or more within 12 hours, that's sort of the trigger for us to issue a special advisory and go ahead and update the intensity forecast and all that other information. Cool, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, throughout the time that you've worked for the National Hurricane Center, have there been any like common biases in certain models that like you've grown accustomed to and know to look out for when you're making your forecasts? You know, the models change basically from our perspective. The models get upgraded every year, so the biases don't really. You, it's not very easy to build up a consistent bias in terms of models anymore. Um, when I first started, I think the model upgrades came a little less frequently, but now the models are upgraded almost every season. So whatever bias that you might have observed the past year don't really carry over to the next season. And the biases you see for even from one storm to another within a given season can vary. So it's really tough to, to try to you know, bias correct your own forecast, try to bias correct the difference from my perspective. Chris? Any other questions, Josh? Josh? Yeah. Hello. Um, so, typically, uh, how many people does it take to get these three out forecasts to go? So like, does one person handle most of the forecasting and then it comes to communication? Is there a trade-off in between people or how does that usually run? Yeah, typically, well, typically we have two forecasters on shift, each shift. Um, you know, it obviously varies because we can have multiple, you know, different numbers of storms, different degrees of uh, storms that are affecting land and have more watches, warnings, and coordination. But generally speaking, there's one person doing the forecast for a given storm. So there's one person going through this sort of whole analysis and forecast process. Um, when we get into a situation where we have a lot of aircraft data and we have all the coordination that comes from the storm affecting land, there'll usually be a second person that's helping out uh, with that coordination, with sort of monitoring the data that's coming in as the, the weather forecaster is working on the forecast itself. Uh, that person might be another hurricane specialist, it might be somebody like me uh, who's helping out. Um, again, it just sort of varies from situation to situation. Obviously, for, for you know, big landfalling storms, like you think like a Michael or a Florence or an Irma, you know, there, there'll be somebody else always taking a look at the forecast, uh, getting a second opinion about how much change should be made in terms of the track or the intensity, all the way up to my level or even the director's level occasionally. So, uh, but you know, there's a lot of eyes on the forecast, but in reality, there's one person sitting there making the forecast most of the time. So in some situations, we might have as many as four people on shift at the same time if we have a, a very large number of storms or we have multiple very impactful storms going on at the same time. And for some situations, uh, for open ocean systems, especially in the East Pacific, it's certainly possible to do two forecast packages, uh, for one person to do two forecast packages in a cycle. Um, that's about all you can do, though. It's really, you can't do more than two. Three is too many. It's not enough time. Okay, great. The next thing I want to really talk about is the fact that, you know, all that we talked about over the last hour is just really only the start. Um, the forecast that we make here is the starting point for IDSS that we're doing agency-wide that's related to tropical cyclones. And again, from here, we're really driving that national level message and helping everybody all the way down to the local WFO level be on the same page for coordinated messaging on TC-related hazards that really drives the preparedness and evacuation decisions in this country that are driven primarily by storm surge. Um, you know, the, the, the tropical cyclone product suite is really focused on probabilistic hazard information through things like probabilistic storm surge, the tropical cyclone wind speed probabilities, and time of arrival information for 34 knot winds that are, again, based on the official forecast and climatological forecast errors. Because we can't have people making community scale evacuation decisions based on a most likely outcome because of the time range that that has to happen for something like storm surge, which might be two or three or even four days away from a potential landfall. The expected value of what you might get in terms of storm surge inundation in a given location 
is not going to adequately capture the actual threat, and, and the, the decisions have to be made on what that risk actually is, not on what's actually expected. So the NXT products, are, the forecast is really driving that probabilistic hazard information that's used for the evacuation decision making. And our products, plus the rainfall information from WPC and the tornado information from SPC, are driving the WFO's hurricane threat and impact graphics, and they're local TC products, which are again providing uh, threat and impact for storm surge, rainfall flooding, winds, tornadoes uh, associated with every tropical cyclone. And then from here, we're also doing uh, coordinating the national to local level messaging through briefings, uh, deployments of WFO forecasters to uh, uh, emergency operations centers, to FEMA, media interviews, social media posts. So there's sort of this whole uh, IDSS process that's starting here at NHC and then filters down through the rest of the agency. And so our messaging objectives are really multifold. We're trying to raise awareness of the existence of a storm in some situations, uh, describe the evolving threat in other situations. Like you have a system like a Florence or an Irma that is coming across the Atlantic for a week or more that you don't really have to raise the awareness of, but you have to describe how the threat's evolving. On the other hand, you have a Hurricane Michael that develops and makes landfall as a Category 5 within three days, and that's a much different objective. You're just trying to get people's attention and let them know that there's this threat coming and to raise their awareness. We're trying to address uncertainty. We're focusing on the hazards, not on the storm details, not on what the exact intensity is, what the Saffir-Simpson category is. What is the potential for hazards? We're trying to encourage preparedness and, again, direct users to trusted sources of information which is a challenge in our sort of social media saturated environment where uh, there's no shortage of uh, alternate forecast scenarios and other types of information that are out there that uh, make it difficult for people to sort of sort through and uh, separate the signal from the noise. So, you know, when we're talking days out, four days before Michael makes landfall, for example, we can't really provide specific detailed information on what's going to happen at a community level. We can't get into exact locations that are going to be affected in timing because there's too much forecast uncertainty. So four days before Michael makes landfall, we're going to be talking about how there's the possibility of storm surge and rain and wind impacts over portions of the northern Gulf Coast by midweek, but we can't get very specific about the exact location and magnitude of these impacts because of the uncertainty in the forecast. But again, raising awareness. And then as the threat increases, you get closer in time, you can start to highlight the uh, impact areas. But again, the information's on knowing which locations are going to see those exact very worst conditions is not yet known. So, for example, you're not going to know that Mexico Beach is going to get the highest storm surge in Michael to you maybe within 6 to 12 hours before landfall. So a day before Michael, we can start to uh, carve out these areas along the Florida Gulf Coast where we have a storm surge warning in effect, where we can see more than six feet of storm surge inundation. We can start to narrow down these areas where you know, there's a pretty broad area here where we can see nine to 13 feet. And again, we're trying to hammer that information home and focus on those impacts and help reinforce those evacuation uh, and preparation decisions that are being made by local emergency managers. Um, again, starting many days away, you're just trying to message potential for impacts, but not specific information. Just encouraging people to pay attention, ensure they have their hurricane plan in place. And as the event approaches and confidence increases, we can uh, allow the messaging to become more specific and more focused. Sometimes we're even doing messaging before we even have a storm. If you go back to the pre-Harvey disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico in 2017, we were issuing a very strongly worded tropical weather outlook talking about storm surge and tropical storm or hurricane force winds and very heavy rainfall. Uh, the, the day before Harvey even reformed as a tropical depression, talking about how watches and warnings could be required. Overall focus, again, at this phase is on potential impacts, not tracker intensity. And we're, we started putting out these key message graphics where we're, again, focusing on hazards and impacts, uh, sort of short, high-level talking points, the most important three or four things about the storm that we want the media and emergency managers and the general public to pick up on. Three to five days or more away, we can start again introducing these key messages, emphasizing preparedness, broad areas that could be impacted. So we started key messages, for example, for Florence about seven days before landfall happened. Um, we we're again talking about the thing we knew for sure at that time was regardless of the eventual track, we're going to have life-threatening surf and rip current conditions developing along the East Coast and talk about the, the threat of 
the risk of other direct impacts from Florida is increasing, but there's so much uncertainty in the track beyond day five, everybody along the U.S. East Coast just basically at this point has to pay attention, ensure they have their hurricane plan in place. Three to five days out, now we can start to focus in on an area. Now we can focus in instead of the entire U.S. East Coast, now we can talk about areas from South Carolina through the Mid-Atlantic region. Again, and now we're talking about increasing risk, we can get more specific to life-threatening impacts from Florence, storm surge at the coast, and freshwater flooding from a prolonged heavy rainfall event inland. So we knew that the storm was gonna start to slow down. We were able to talk, start talking about using wording like life-threatening and coordinating that across the agency. And in this time frame, we have preparedness actions underway. So we're again, encouraging people to follow the advice that are being given by the local officials because people may be talking about evacuations and other things at this point. Using things like the time of arrival products to keep the focus off the exact track forecast and, and provide or reinforce the, the fact that the hazards are going to occur out away from the center beyond where the cone uh, uh, is going to be shown. So again, this is showing the chances of tropical storm force winds and when those winds could arrive at various locations. In the watch warning phase, again, keep messaging focused on the hazards, not the track and the intensity. And now we can start to break out the messaging on the individual hazards and provide more detail. So now we're talking about life-threatening storm surges likely along portions of the coastline from South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, where we have a storm surge watching effect. Life-threatening freshwater flooding is likely from this prolonged and exceptionally heavy rainfall event inland over the Carolinas and mid-Atlantic for hundreds of miles, potentially. Damaging hurricane force winds, large swells. So again, we're focusing on what we know where we can start to narrow down the areas. So again, we're able to focus in at this point on areas around, say, New Bern on the Pamlico, on the Noose River, for example, that with, with where we knew or where we thought the highest storm surge was gonna be, focusing in here with the rainfall in southeastern North Carolina. And because the hazards can occur in different locations at different times, they're requiring different responses. Uh, you think of like a Harvey where you've had storm surge and extreme wind with landfall near the Corpus Christi area, and then uh, catastrophic flooding in southeast Texas, the Houston metro area, days later. So we're trying to manage all of those threats from NHC, again, because we're handling the storm scale, we're handling all of that at once. And then in that watch warning time frame, the local WFO graphics and products and hazard-specific uh, information can really help them uh, message the location and timing of those very uh, most significant impacts from surge and rainfall and wind impacts. Now in a situation like a Michael, quickly evolving threat, we have to use those again words like life-threatening storm surge is likely along the Florida uh, uh, Gulf Coast. Uh, the, and again here we were able within that last few hours before landfall talk about where we expected the worst storm surge to occur between Tyndall Air Force Base and Keaton Beach with 9 to 13 feet of inundation. Uh, we were hitting the fact that there was going to be catastrophic wind damage where the core of the hurricane moved on shore and that hurricane force winds could occur well inland across the Florida Panhandle and into Georgia and potentially southeastern Alabama. So hitting that dangerous hurricane force wind threat that was going to extend well inland in, in this unusual case. We're doing briefings. This is the cadence of our briefings that we were doing for FEMA in the various states leading up to Florence. So landfall was on September 14th. We started doing briefings a week before, having calls with North Carolina, talking to them about what uh, storm surge risk mapping they should start looking at six or seven days out to give them an idea of what they might be looking at in terms of evacuations, helping FEMA to figure out where they're going to have to start positioning resources. And again, uh, you know, being as available to answer questions from these uh, partner core partners about the forecast uncertainty, what the trends we see in the forecast are, and, and help provide them the information they need to make their decisions. And again, there's a lot of coordination that goes on behind the scene. We usually have a DSS coordinator deployed here to the Hurricane Center uh, that works in our operations area and facilitates communication from the Hurricane Center all the way out to WFOs and deployed weather service personnel at EOCs and ensures that that messaging is consistent within the organization and assists with the forecast coordination. So, so that's sort of our messaging uh, you know, philosophy here from the national level here at NHC. So I'll be glad to take any other questions you might have at this point, so thanks.
guys have any questions, uh, I, would, I think the best option is definitely going to be to use the microphones. If you have questions, just I'll have Nolan race you the microphone really quickly and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He's made for this. Any questions? Yeah. So, my question for you is you've talked a lot about previous hurricanes that have impacted great areas like Harvey, Florence. For you personally, what was the hardest hurricane for you to forecast? And what was your easiest one to forecast? If you can no, answer none of, none of them are easy. I, I, I can answer that easily. Um, hard ones are hard for different reasons. You can think of something like a Sandy uh, because of the changes that we were going to see in the structure and the complications in terms of the messaging that came along with that extra tropical transition that it went through before landfall. Uh, I think back to, um, you can go all the way back to something like Joaquin, where we had a storm that was moving basically away from all the track guidance for a prolonged period of time near the Bahamas very slowly and resulted in the loss of a, uh, the El Faro cargo ship at sea. You know, all of those situations all come back to your mind. I mean, I think, me personally, I think the day that Michael made landfall and watching that sort of happen will be something that I'll probably never really ever work through entirely. And sort of the, the fact that you know that, uh, you, you know when you have a Michael or an Irma or a, uh, or a Florence that, uh, you know, that, that there are gonna be fatalities and you're doing the most you can to get the word out, but you know what, Think back to Dorian this year, for example, um, that you know what's going to happen, you know the catastrophe that's going to unfold in a certain place, and you feel like you're doing everything you can to, to reach that, but you still know that there are going to be people that aren't going to get the message, and there are still going to be fatalities. And, and going to see places that have been affected by Michael or Florence and actually going and talking to people in that community, you, you really take away the, the, that scars a place for a generation, perhaps. And just knowing the, the consequence of those events is something that you just carry with you all the time. Yeah, uh, my question would be, how, how does the National Hurricane Center um, communicate with other countries whenever you guys are issuing advisories and warnings and watches and whatnot? Most of it's done by uh, just tele calling on the telephone. Um, some of it's done by email, but we do a lot of, we lay the groundwork for all that coordination actually ahead of time. We have a, uh, the WMO has a Region 4 Hurricane Committee that is chaired by the United States and includes all the other countries in the Caribbean. And they have a meeting every spring and we have a hurricane operations plan that lays out how we're going to coordinate with those nations. Uh, and most of it's done by telephone. Um, we have those relationships with the, the MET services there in the various countries. Uh, sometimes it's pretty complicated, though. If you have a storm, say, approaching the Lesser Antilles, you might have to make five or six phone calls and dealing with islands that want to know what their neighbor is going to do before they issue a watch or warning for their island. Or you have St. Martin that's split in half between the French and the Dutch, and they don't always agree what they're going to do. So there, it's a lot of coordination and patience, but I would, I, I, it's not exaggerate, exaggeration to say that our relationship as an RSMC to the countries in our area is, I think, the poster child for all the others in the world. I think we have the best uh, coordination plan and the best effective coordination with the countries in our area of responsibility of, of all the RSMCs globally. service that um, you can access at any particular time. I know some offices that have been affected uh, have had counselors come in after the fact during a storm or after a storm. One of the challenges we face here is that we have to deal with every storm. Uh, in addition to storms that might personally affect us, you can go back to the question about 
challenging forecast. And you know, when we had Irma here, we were sheltered in place and we had to get our families ready and people had to evacuate. We had to board up our homes and we had to deal with that additional stress on our own personal lives. And then right after Irma, we didn't get to have a break and relax and try to recover. We just went right on into Maria and watched that happen in Puerto Rico and everything else. So it just keeps going. So it, uh, you know, it, it's something that I think there's a much better recognition of in the meteorological community and the physical science community that we do have to take care of ourselves from a mental health perspective. And so we try to, you know, get through the, the stressful times together and then make the resources that we can available to the staff that need it after the fact. That's a great question. I have one. Um, so in the case where, you know, you mentioned during the case study that when you have, uh, when you have windshield wipering on the models, you want to kind of stick with the center so you're not going back and forth on your forecast track. In the case of something more like Joaquin, where you're consistently left at guidance, how, much, how hard is it to kind of keep forecast consistency so you're not jumping, but yeah. also catch back up to the storm? Yeah, Joaquin, th those situations where you have a, a sort of a bimodal distribution in the model guidance are probably the most challenging from a track forecast perspective, um, where you know that the playing the consensus is not going to be the right answer most likely, but it still is a way to minimize error. And hopefully you can wait out that sort of model disagreement. But in some cases, you just are forced to make a big change. Um, you can go back to a storm in the Gulf of Mexico we had a few years ago, where all the mo most of the model guides initially had a track towards Texas. And then within 18 hours, everything switched to a track to the east towards Florida. And we had to make some very, very large changes to the track forecast. And, that's where the messaging comes in because we can still only make one deterministic official forecast. So the messaging and the uh, briefings and the communication and the discussion of the uncertainty really come into play in those types of situations because then you're not just talking about sort of garden variety, everyday forecast uncertainty. You're talking about very large forecast uncertainty that can mean the difference between the whole different parts of the basin perhaps being affected by a storm. So those are particularly challenging. Thankfully, they don't come along all that often. But, uh, but they are, they are the biggest in terms of track challenges that I think of that we can face. And you know, eventually, we would like our probabilistic products, things like the wind speed probabilities of P-Surge, to eventually transition to being driven by dynamical model ensembles that capture more of the situationally specific uncertainty rather than relying on climatological error. So there's the early stages of work that are ongoing to try and capture and try to sort of push toward that, but we're not there yet. We first get there for track, going there for intensity and structure will take a much longer time. Season, um, sort of the off season has some different phases. You know, once we get after um, November ends and we get into December, people are working on post analysis. We're writing, basically going back and doing the post analysis on every storm in both basins, writing up the tropical cyclone reports. We're also having uh, like policy meetings to talk about the tropical program within the Weather Service that are going to look ahead to changes that are going to be made to products and services for the next year. Uh, then when we get into the January, February time frame, we're starting to do training here. We have three week-long classes that we teach here that are actually FEMA courses for state and local emergency managers from the Gulf Coast, the Northeast, and the Southeast. And we teach a week-long class here about tropical cyclone hazards, our products, evacuation decision-making, and there's exercises and breakout sessions. So we're involved with three of those. We also go out and do a significant amount of training on the road at places like the National Hurricane Conference. Especially the time period from March, April, and into early May, is a lot of it's outward directed outreach at state EM meetings. Uh, you go, we have, again, conferences at the WMO Hurricane Committee, this year we have the AMS Hurricane Conference. So 
uh, in addition to working with EMC on model upgrades and uh, you know, product changes and verification and doing all of that. And in some ways, the off-season can be busier than the, er the earlier shoulder parts of the hurricane season. So there's this big push to get everything done but before we get into May or early June. And hopefully the beginning part of the hurricane season might be a little quieter before we get into the peak. But the off-season is, is extremely busy. So everybody has sort of different focal points, uh, international coordination, training, the science aspects of things, new product development. We have a lot of social science work going on right now through various NOAA-funded social science projects that are looking at things from the Tropical Cyclone product suite to how people use the cone graphic to how people interpret numerical values when they're assessing risk. So we're looking at, going to be looking at a lot of social science input uh, coming in in the next couple of years that will hopefully help us guide sort of our next uh, evolution of our tropical cyclone product suite within the agency. Um, with all the information that the public is given about um, like a, a, a storm that's coming, um, it can be quite overstimulating for people who don't understand the information they are reading. So what's like the biggest piece of advice you give to someone who isn't necessarily, um, who doesn't understand what, they're, what all of this information is? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, try to, the first thing I try to get people to focus, to, to not focus on small changes in the forecast and not obsess about the category of the storm or sort of the storm trivia, exactly what the pressure is, what the wind speeds are. And then the other thing is don't worry about what the models are doing. You know, people are looking at model plots and spaghetti plots and every, obsessing over every deterministic model run wobble to the left or to the right. Trust the fact that there's somebody here using all of that, looking at all that, using their expertise and making a forecast so you don't have to. Um, you know, that's sort of the message we try to convey to people is that we're taking care of the forecast part for you. We have products that count for the forecast uncertainty, so you don't have to worry about that either. And then you can use the product suite that we have. And again, listen to your local government officials and find your trusted sources of information. I always try to encourage people to, you know, find their local broadcast meteorologist that they trust. Uh, find somebody that you have that relationship with that you're going to believe what they say don't worry about what you're seeing on social media or what you might be seeing on the national news. It's not going to tell you what's going to happen at your particular location and what sort of uh, preparations you need to make at that sort of community scale. And again, don't panic because you need to have all that stuff figured out about your hurricane plan and your preparations done well in advance so you're not figuring it out when there's a storm coming and you can just sort of put your plan into action. That's sort of the message we try to convey to people is get all that done ahead of time. To what extent does the National Hurricane Center conduct like pre-analysis of an upcoming season based on climatological factors or anything else? We have some folks, we have two or three staff that are involved in the seasonal forecast that NOAA puts out, but that product actually comes out of the Climate Prediction Center, but it does have some input from us in it. But we, we try not to focus too much on the seasonal forecast aspect because it, it doesn't really help our core message of having everybody prepared every year, regardless of how busy the season may be from a basin-wide perspective. So we try to de-emphasize that and, uh, and focus again on just the, the, the baseline preparation that everybody has to make. But certainly from a science perspective, there's, there's value there and it's an important thing to do and we have some, some connection to it. Thanks for the opportunity, and uh, feel free to I have my email there at the last yeah, slot. Exactly. But feel free to drop me an email if anybody has any questions. Yeah, glad sure. To, glad to answer. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
team. So, and Bill Reed was, was already out of the ranking center by that point. So, I don't want to brag, but I know it was too stop. I didn't suppose. I did. I'm from Virginia, so I thought it was Ivan, actually. Who do you think it was? I said I, I said I only knew okay. it was Jason. I thought it was Ivan. That's fine. At first I thought it was Burnley, and then I and then I looked it up again. I second guessed myself at first. I'm like, is this Gustav? And like, we're talking about it. I think it is. But I forgot that Burnley ran. Yeah. Well, see, I was going off because I didn't realize it was. I forgot. I forgot. It have a good night, guys. I have there's left over pizza. Feel free to take it. Yeah. Roll for the pizza. If you can call it a pizza, it's a pizza shop, so it, 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 it barely even counts as food. What? Exactly. And for 19 pizzas, it costs 106 dollars. What SGA cuts your budget by 30 percent? That's a high rate. How much did it She's watching the movie. <laughs> I'm not going to say 15, but I'm going to say I plan on being in bed by 10.30. OU's VSW starts tomorrow, and I have to be in tip-top shape. 8 a.m. Yeah, those are good questions. I was literally emailing I'm going to send him... I'm going to send him a thank you note for his hard work, because... He used a lot of graphics for that. They were hard ones, got to come through school, and I want to send them to a thing. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to bog down. I think I'm going to bog down. I think I'm going to bog down.